time so that we have a decent amount of quest time for questions in between uh, the sessions. We won't make the speakers wait for questions at the end. Um, first up, I'd like to introduce Thorny Staples talking about work they're doing at the Smithsonian. Um, I've actually had several people mention this, this work to me uh, in the course of conversations uh, at the conference so far, so I'm sure it's going to be very exciting. Thorny's got a 20-year background in dealing with large, complex digital objects and repositories. So, go. Thanks. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Well, the mic's working. OK. Um, yeah, I've been around this community a lot longer than I want <laughs> to remember at this point. Um, but anyway, um, so I, I went back to the Smithsonian about a year and a half. Um, I was very interested in trying to do something with the repository systems that we've been developing. I was involved in developing the Fedora repository. And I got involved in that because of the digital scholarly projects that I'd worked on starting back in 1992 at the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities. I thought digital libraries were about building something much more complex than just putting our collections online. So I finally now am able to start doing what I got into doing Fedora in the first place. So I'm very excited to be able to present this. Um, I should start off by saying what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you screenshots, but it's working software that's the very first version of a system that's designed to let the researchers put their own data in a repository from the moment it's the first gleam in their eye. From the moment they first have an email with another collaborator about a project, they have a place to start putting data. Um, and that then it becomes, it goes off, it's in their control and goes off to curatorial later. Um, so let me start off. I know most of you probably know about the Smithsonian, and I assume most of you think of the Smithsonian as the 19 museums. Um, 17 or 16 of them, I can't remember, are in Washington, and there's some others in other places. But we were founded to be a research institute originally, um, and um, researchers drag stuff home and collect it, and you have to do something with it, so we develop museums. But we have, in addition to the 19 museums, we have nine research centers, and that's science-oriented research centers, eight advanced study centers, 22 libraries, two major archives, and about 20 small archives scattered around the institution. Um, and a zoo, so the Washington Zoo is one of our, um, in one of our units. Um, we tend to do a lot of our research concentrates in long-term baseline research in uh, biodiversity, environmental um, information, but also um, astrophysics. We have the Smithsonian Astrophysics Observatory, which is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We have 900 employees up there. We have the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. We have 300 employees down there. So that'll show you. I mean, we have a lot of employees in Washington at the museums, but um, a lot of our budget goes towards running research. Um, we also have, in the museums especially, um, a lot of research going on in cultural heritage areas, history, art, all those things. Um, the curators and the education people in the museum are creating new information. And none of this, almost none of this, is going into any kind of systematic management at all. It's literally classic under the desk on a file system on a, hard, on a, on a server under someone's desk. Um, except for SAO. SAO runs the Chandra X-ray telescope um, and they're on contract to NASA so all their data goes to NASA. So they have re really excellent management but they're an anomaly at the Smithsonian. Um, so the problem is we have to be able to capture this research information and I think we have to capture it from the very beginning and make it durable. And I like to use the word durable much better than preservation. I will not use the word preservation with my researchers. I don't want them ever to even hear the word. Um, I want them to understand that their data is going to be in action and stay in action as long as it can and to be trusted to be what it was. And that's what I think durability means. So I think it's a better word to use with them. Um, uh, the Smithsonian is now, I know you know about the NSF data management plans. I've heard them talked about here and other uh, foundations are starting to do the same thing. Um, the Smithsonian has a policy in place, no way to implement it yet, but a policy in place that requires a data management plan for every, every digital project that starts up anywhere in the institution, whether it's digitizing museum collections, research projects in any of the institutions, any of the um, units. They're supposed to start doing a data management plan. And the data management plan is supposed to say where they're going to manage their data. Well, the, the sordid little truth is we don't have any place to manage the data yet. But putting that policy in place is starting to get people thinking in the right direction. Um, so a big part of the problem, we're seeing already just in the first four uh, projects that we're working with as our testbed projects, we're seeing 
very complex arrays of large numbers of files. Small files, and we're working with, we're concentrating on the small science kind of research first. Um, but our, one of our first projects was a, a carbon sequestration project at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Had over 100,000 spreadsheets. And these are spreadsheets that are global warming data that lots of other people want to get their hands on, but there's no way to do it. Five years after the project's done, no one can remember which variables were which in the spreadsheets. They can't remember what the di directory structure that it's all contained in really means exactly. So it's the classic problem. Um, so I think in, inherently we're going to be dealing with projects with lots of objects and lots of complex relationships among them to be made sense of. Um, capturing the full structure and context of that project is the critical part to understanding all the pieces. This is not a library model. It's essentially a network model and I think the opening plenary really he put his, his finger right on what we all have to be thinking and how we have to be thinking about it. But we have to be thinking about the network from the very beginning. Um, and that last point is the hardest one of all. There's no way we're going to do this for the researchers. They're going to have to do it themselves. They're going to have to at least minimally describe what their stuff is in aggregate or in it individually on some level. And I'll show you what we're doing. Well, we can let them get away with something pretty minimal, but they're going to have to do something. Um, so the key to that, if we want them to do it, is we have to provide the incentive to make them want to do it. So the point here is not to make the researchers think they have to become archivists. I don't even want to talk to them about that. We're not going to get in the way. The durability side of the, of the equation is not going to get in their way. We're going to give them an active workspace where but if they start putting their data in the workspace, in, the, in a trusted repository, it goes in a trusted repository, but it's it's done in such a way that they can do a, a minimal job if they want, and then they can take advantage of tools that are already plugged in. So we're creating, I like the whole idea of a virtual research environment, but we have to make a, a repository-enabled virtual research environment so the data is in an abstract management scheme and that can plug into all the specific tools. That's the goal. And I think, also what I'm going to show you, I think it's the, the setting down the foundation to let us start doing that. Um, this is, the, uh, this is the diagram that I use. It's not really a data flow diagram exactly. It's more trying to remind us of all the things we have to care about. So um, down here in the lower, uh, lo your left, there's the idea that data is going to come to us in batches from other systems. It's also going to come interactively. And as people digitize something with the ideas, we want them to start having a place to upload it as they create it. Um, it goes into what I think of as a content creation management environment which is I'm going to show you the first version of the software that does that. That idea there is this is a, a, a software environment that gives them what they need to manage the data as it's created and then over time updated, do whatever they need to do to manage it. And it goes into a repository. So we have the, at least the conceptual idea that there's two repositories. The researcher's repository is where they own the data. When they, they get an account on our system, they have uh, a space when they put objects into their account, they own them. And in Fedora terms, what that means is they're the owner of the object, which means they can set the policies. And I think that's not only a specific technical thing, it's a good conceptual way of looking at it. The owner of the content has control of the policies. This is critical to get their buy-in. Um, but so in the researcher's trusted repository, they can expose it to the public if they want or not. They manage it, they can have their groups working with it, whatever, the, we have the functionality, let them do that. And then it, the, that purple box is sort of a conceptual idea that somehow we're going to have to be able to gather data and bring it back into the system for them to work with. In the beginning, the con they put their data in the content creation management environment. It goes into the repository. They pull it back in to the two other environments, both software tools that are plugged in, one for analysis tools and one for dissemination tools. And they use their own data. That equation has to also include federated repositories. We're not worrying about that right now, but we're, it's a placeholder to say we know we're going to go there. Our, our first four projects that we're working with all have collaborators at many of your universities. So our scientists are out working with academic people all the time already. And they have, they're all collaborating, international collaborations, in, like I said, in the first four projects. So um, anyway, that's the ba basic picture. And I'll refer back to this, the ideas in this as I show you the software. Um, this is key to the whole thinking. Um, excuse me. 
As I said, I don't think this is a model of putting the library online. This is the model. We're building something new. It's a network. It's the web. But it's not the World Wide Web that's such a terrible information management uh, s s schema. It's a, it's a new formal web of content. And I think the repositories, the reason I was attracted to Fedora, it gives us the notion of a digital object. And then we, over time in the project, we added formal relationships, RDF relationships among the objects, which gives us the ability to start creating networks implicit in the way the data is managed. Um, and I think that's, in, that's critical because what we're talking about with durability is, is as I said, keeping, keeping the information in action. I don't think we'll be able to take make a snapshot of, of a research project and take it offline without losing something. And that's our, I think we're already there, but increasingly it's going to be more and more true. We're going to have to keep it in action and keep it connected up to keep its full meaning in, in place. And to be able to sustain it, we're all going to have to act like, all of us repository owners, curators are going to act like we're curating one corner of the big network in the world. Policies will make all kinds of reasons why we can't necessarily share every single thing all the time but we have to start building it as if we're going to, because that's, that's just the, that's where it's all going. That's the name, I'm, my soapbox. <laughs> um, you can throw tomatoes at me later if you don't like that idea. Um, so I think it, it, that's why the entire scheme that I'm building is built on the idea that when people share stuff, they'll link to stuff that's already online. We may move data from one repository to another when the, when the curatorial responsibility changes. But as far as one researcher using another researcher's data, I think we need to think about it as the web and we're just linking to it and we have to be able to treat it as if it's now in our network, in our corner of the network. Okay, um, so this is just to go back and remind us about what we mean by digital object because everything's <laughs> built from here on that. Um, I think of a digital object, in Fedora terms, a digital object, as one unit of content. I know there's a lot of people who think every single file needs to be its own object, but I think we need to have some level where we look at information at the con from the content point of view. If I've got 10 files that make up my view of an image of an artwork because I have different kinds of metadata and multiple <laughs> images of it, it's all one object. And the relationships between that unit of content and another one are the important thing, not the fact that I've got 10 files and three of them, one of them is a thumbnail, one of them is a screen size, right? Um, so, um, well, where's I going to go with that? Anyway, um, everything's in, in objects. So, um, and ultimately what, we're, what I'm proposing and what we've built, and this is, I meant to say this in the beginning, this is a prototype. We are running a project, not a program yet at the Smithsonian. We had no funding when I started. I had no help. Now I have Beth Stern over here who works with me, and there's two of us, and we got a little bit of budget, um, so we're moving. So we're trying to prove a concept, and when we do prove the concept, somebody's going to go to a big sugar daddy funder, private person who's going to give the Smithsonian money, or someone's going to go to Congress and start the endless fight to get a, an increase to the budget to do this, because it's not there now. Anyway, sorry, I should have said that earlier. So the idea is... <laughs> The, we have two kinds of objects that we're building everything. So the, I, what you think of as the digital artifacts, the images, the text, all the things that we're managing, we call those resource objects. They're digital resources. Uh, we manage them individually. And I, oh, I know the point I meant to make before. Um, an object is a unit of content. But if something is a part of a whole, so a page image of a book, the book has an object. And all the files that are about the whole go in that object. They're part of that unit of content. And if I have a separate page image, 400 page images of the book, I've got 400 other objects. That's the way, I, when I say unit of content, it's a whole unit. Right? So uh, I, these are not hard and fast. I've been trying to come up with these rules for 10 years. That's as far as I've gotten um, for what an object is. But it's working pretty well for us Okay, so far. So the other idea here that's new in this is the concept objects. So we have the notion of a concept object that's just a metadata. It has one data stream that's descriptive metadata, and it stands in for some conceptual entity. And a, the research project as a whole is the first <laughs> level of entity. I have an object that has metadata that holds essentially a little database of metadata about the project as a whole. And then I can have child concept objects that divide the, say, divide a project into subprojects with different of postdocs running the different parts. Different experiments can be represented as conceptual objects. If I'm doing research on the collection and I want to bring 10 paintings from the collection, 
in to start doing a, a virtual exhibition, which is what a lot of our curators do, I create 10 concept objects for those paintings. And then the images are resources of them that are associated with them. So we build a, a network, a backbone of concept objects, and then relate the, the resources to them. So the resources are leaf nodes in the network, and the network is built out by building an array of concepts. OK? Um, how am I doing? <laughs> OK, I better go quickly. So anyway, here's the picture of how that looks. Concept objects, you can make a bunch of them. And then you have all different kinds of resources. And I won't go into that, because I want to just show you the software. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is when you first come into the software and you're in a project. Um, this has a lot of test data in it, but uh, let's see. Um, you see up there where the object says Sarah Juan Diaz. This is a, an archaeologic um, dig that we're working with the archaeologist, and we're capturing all the data from the dig. So there's an object at the top that represents the site as a whole. The metadata that you see in this big window over on the right is the concept overview. That's the content of the concept object. So when you highlight a concept object in the tree on the left, you get the, the content. Um, and what I want to add, OK, across the top, you can see where it says concept overview, resources, and viewer. That's how you look at the resources, and I'll get to that in a minute. But from the concept, you can edit the metadata. So I can click that, and I'll show you. You get an edit form directly editing the XML, pulling the data out of the data stream, putting it back. And then you can add a new concept. The exhibit we'll get to in a minute. Um, and you edit the permissions. So every object, the, the researcher controls the permissions. And they, they go to the object directly, and they can set the permissions. The resources have many of these same kinds of things. So essentially, the network is there, and they're operating within it. And all the functionality is associated with where they are in the network. Um, at the bottom, where it says link to another concept, they can start doing a type ahead and other concept objects that are in there. They can make another link. So they can put this concept as a separate link under an existing. So they can have multiple. Multi it's not a simple hierarchy. Um, and then at the bottom, it shows you where it already has these parents. This has one parent. So I'm looking at operation three, which is the, the record of a particular year's excavation. Um, OK, so here when you click on. Um, when we, on that page, when you click on the Add Concept, you first get a list of, an ont we have an ontology of concepts. And so, so far, these are the ones we have. A project or subproject, natural history collection, research site, plot, or area, person, organization, or institution, expedition, a camera trap, or an animal or plant species. This is the first bunch of projects needed these. Over time, we plan to have about 25 of these, these concepts, types. They're big, big classes of concepts. When you select one of those concepts, then you get a form. You can customize the form to the particular use of that concept. So a site, a site in general, we have an FGDC record of Federal uh, Geographic Data uh, Committee. I try to expand all acronyms. Um, but anyway, so you choose this, the, the, the um, um, form that you're going to use, and then it kicks you into the edit. All right, going back up here. So now. Um, I want to show you that I believe the next one is edit. So when yeah, when you click edit, that opens that the data, the metadata that you saw in the concept overview window is now in the edit form. And you can go in and change it. And then when you submit it, it just updates the object and it's version. It's all based on the, the object versioning that's in Fedora. So everything's versioned as you go. Um, so back up to the top, and this is where, oh, this is I think looking at the resources. So that resource button at the top when you click that, yes, <laughs> good. You, uh, you see the list of resources that are associated with that concept. Uh, what the, the different color, the gold, is representing the fact that these resources have been uploaded and no one's touched the metadata yet. So you can upload a batch of resources without having to do the metadata right then, but you gotta, it'll, it'll remind you that you haven't done it. And you won't be able to do certain, you won't get certain benefits if you don't do the metadata. Um, all right, so, oh, and I should have said, I didn't get into it, but the, the navigation, so on the left, you can open the whole hierarchy. And these are the titles out of the metadata of all the concept objects. And you click on it, and you jump to that concept in the hierarchy. I'm sorry, that's I, sort of implicit in my mind at this point, so I should have said it. Um, so this is where I, I clicked. Here, let me go back. I clicked on the research, the resource that's directly below that white band. Um, and this is a, a bunch of artifacts that were found in the tomb in the operation. Um, so you have access to that. And then uh, this is the, when, when you're on the resource, it first pops up in a viewer, so you see the resource. And then you click on the resource overview, and you go to the metadata. And that's where you can add more resources to that, um, 
that oh no, on the resource tab is where you add more resources. So if you click on that, it kicks off a workflow that adds batches of resources to this concept. So it's all built on operating on the node where you are in the network. Um, back to this. Now, one of the first benefits, and this what I'm showing you so far is the uh, the the uh, uh, data creation and management environment, right? So this is the management client. If I click on exhibit, then I go to a web view. So whichever concept I was on, when I jump to the web view, it uses that concept as the center of the universe. It gives me the metadata formatted up. And then at the bottom, it, it will list the resources that are associated with it and give you access to them. And on the, on the right-hand side, you can navigate up and down the tree. So this is separate. This is taking advantage of what I just did in the management interface, but I could expose this to the public. I could expose it to my my collaborators, all the permissions will operate. So if I make something available, they'll see it. If I don't, I can make all my concepts available so they can understand my research and I can keep all of my resources private and they won't see any of them. And as I open up a resource, I just change it to, uh, to uh, public and then they can see it. Um, so let's see. So if I walk, I think the way I have this set up, if I walk down the tree, okay, so I clicked on early tombs then it, there's nothing, no data in that one at this point. This is all test. Um, and I go down to the, this tomb, feature 94, which is a tomb. Here are the resources below. You can see them a little better. Um, and what, what's going across there, so for each of the resources on this page, I can click on the, the image itself and view the resource. Yep, and it comes up. And then I can, um, there's a download over there, and there's the metadata view, so I can, I can expose all this stuff to people who don't, I don't want messing with it. Um, what else can I say about that? Oh, the policies are all operational here. I can set the policy so no one can download it and you wouldn't see the download. That's the, the general idea. Um, anyway, and that's, that's it. Stunned into silence. Um, apologies if I missed this. Um, Paul Stainthorpe from the University of Lincoln in the UK. Um, you may have mentioned this. Probably not. Is, is, is there any notion that concepts would be greater than your institution? So concepts would be common across other um, institutions? Well, ideally, I'm, we're building this as a, as a pilot to say, here's how we want to do it. We'll make this work within our institution. If anybody else got interested, we would start to, I mean, I'm pro essentially proposing something, a set of concepts that we think are universal, and we're gonna try to, I mean, the Smithsonian, it's what, what's interesting about the Smithsonian, we are a really good microcosm of the world. We don't have everything, but we have a little bit of most things, uh, most different domains. And I, what I didn't say is when you s select the concept, you're selecting a particular uh, schema of metadata and a set of forms. Right, so when they don't know which metadata they're using, I don't want them to know what metadata they're using. They're just selecting it and they get an appropriate form which puts the data in an appropriate schema. But as far as making those more universal and shareable, it's the same problem we've got with identifiers. We're building this so it'll work locally, but I'm trying to build it as if the whole world were collaborating already and the functionality. So I could share the, if I had a formal identifier that was globally resolvable, I could have links to any one of these concept objects could be anywhere in the world and they could, you could overlap. So I can, someone can go in and look at a project and if they have permissions to see it, they can link it on their concept under their own project and have all the stuff there. They can't, mean, they can't touch it because they won't have the rights to edit it, but they could actually link it. So, I mean, it's, we're trying to build a, a prototype that looks like that, but I couldn't, there's no way I can tell you anybody else can use it. I have a quick question okay. before you take that microphone yep. off. I'm, I'm just wondering, coming from a university, whether you think there's anything different about the kind of institution oh. you're working for. Yeah, that make it, would, would this work in a, in a typical university context? I, I, didn't, I didn't say this. I meant to say this too. Um, we are, one thing that makes it possible for us to start this experiment is at the Smithsonian, all of the researchers are federal employees. They're government employees responsible to the taxpayers. We have a policy in place that says after one year, their data has to be public, unless they make the case why, why it needs to be held back a little longer. That's a huge advantage, which universities don't have. 
Um, but it lets us start to experiment with this way of working, I think, um, and get going, and we'll see. We have other, we have other problems, like <laughs> the government, <laughs> you know, the funding. <laughs> it's insane, and how are we getting any money? I don't know, but, um, but we do have an advantage there. It does make it a lot easier. They have to play in some sense. They don't, they don't necessarily think that, but they do. <laughs> Policy says they do. You ask the researchers, they probably say they own their data, but the, the Secretary of the Smithsonian would beg to differ. Hi, uh, Joseph Green from uh, University College Dublin. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering how do you communicate the, uh, the network philosophy to the uh, people who will be using the data or well, creating the data, and yeah. how do you, how, it looks to me like a file structure. I know better, but it no, looks like a file structure. No, it's exactly like, that's the point. I meant to say this too, but 20 minutes, you forget. Well, uh, what I was going to say, though, is um, <laughs> a lot of people make very ugly file structures. Very ugly file oh, yeah, structures. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we're not going to, they can make all the ugly they want. They can put all the stuff they want in here, and then it goes off to the curators, and the curators may change it. The curators may clean it up, throw stuff away. I don't know. We're not going to tell the researchers they can't do something. But at a minimum, I meant to say, I think I said this, part of this, but um, all they have to, all that's going to be required in a concept is a title. So they can build out a whole concept structure just by putting titles in a bunch of objects and doing no more metadata. They have a, essentially, they have a, a file system. But it's in objects that has that node is now part of the trusted repository that says this is an organizing node for all of these others. And when they go to the website, the web view is part of the incentive. So if they put a, only a title and they go to the web page and they share it with their collaborators, all it's got is a title. If they go back to the management client and add a description to the metadata and go back to the website, they'll see it immediately. So the more metadata they put in, the more their research, the public's going to see on their website. So that's the beginning. And as we go, I mean, for, for example, for tabular data objects, if they put a, they will be required, the ver first version doesn't have this, but the next version will, They'll be required to do a code book for their, if they upload a, a spreadsheet, they'll have to do a little code book which essentially defines the variables. And if they do very minimal variables, they can get away with it. If they do richer variables, it'll show up. Right, so the, and so their, the point of that is they'll have, they can download their data object as an SPSS file, which already has all the metadata in the places that they're already typing all the metadata in when they do an SPSS run. Um, and they'll get that benefit. And now we're trying to find every little point where we can give them a little bit of incentive to do it right, and only requiring them to do as much as they have to do, and letting them make ugly if they have to. It's just part of the thing. Part of the, we can't get in the way that much. I'm sure it's very beautiful to them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And a curator can decide later, you know, this is ugly and I'm not gonna take it. All right. Thank you.